Hey everybody, this is Chad Tornade, one of the hosts of the Pro Wrestling Almanac Podcast. I just wanted to say thank you for listening and introduce you to one of our great sponsors. When you're planning for an anniversary, wedding reception, or the next WWE pay-per-view, Mayor Smokehouse Barbecue Catering has you covered. Slow-smoked barbecue from pork ribs, pulled pork, tri-tip, chicken wings, and more, plus a variety of sides. Mayor Smokehouse Barbecue Catering is based out of Norco, California, serving the Inland Empire. Go to the website, mayorsbbq.com, M-A-Y-E-R-S-B-B-Q, and on Facebook, at Mayor Smokehouse Barbecue. At Mayor Smokehouse Barbecue, it's barbecue smoked to perfection. The Pro Wrestling Almanac Podcast. <laughs> Celebrating professional wrestling from yesterday, today, and tomorrow. For wrestling fans, wrestling fans hey everyone thanks for tuning in to episode eight of the pro wrestling almanac podcast on this week's episode we're going to discuss ring of honor champion cody signing an exclusive contract with ring of honor page returning to the wwe performance center bully ray and a possible in-ring retirement the brutal beatdown of cruiserweight champion enzo amori and our thoughts as we look back at wwe no mercy For our Ghost of Wrestling Past segment, we will be discussing the WCW Monday Nitro from January 4th, 1999, and our Indie Spotlight segment featuring Rise Wrestling based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. But first, it's time for the Wrestling Results Roundup. The Wrestling Results Roundup. Here are the results from this week's televised shows. On NXT, Johnny Gargano beat Tino Sabatelli, Bianca Belair beat Lacey Evans, Lars Sullivan beat No Way Jose, and Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly beat Trent Seven and Tyler Bate. On Lucha Underground, Dante Fox beat Tejano, Marty the Moth Martinez and Mariposa beat Phoenix and Melissa Santos, and Pentagon Dark and Son of Havoc beat Paul London, Saltador, Malasuerte, Drago, and Cortez Castro, and will meet in a ladder match for the vacant Gift of the Gods Championship. On GFW Impact Wrestling, Johnny Impact beat KM, Taya Valkyrie beat Ava Story, El Io del Fantasma and Pegano beat Impact Grand Champion Ethan Carter III and Eddie Edwards, Congo Kong beat Mahabali Shera, and Johnny Impact beat Tejano. On Ring of Honor, Death Before Dishonor 15, Bully Ray and the Briscoes, Mark and Jay Briscoe, beat The Kingdom, Matt Taven, TKO Ryan, and Vinny Marseglia, and will face the World Six-Man Tag Team Champions later in the show. Marty Skrull beat Chuck Taylor. Punishment Martinez beat Jay White in a street fight. World Six-Man Tag Team Champions, The Hung Bucks, Hangman Page, Matt Jackson, and Nick Jackson beat Bully Ray and the Briscoes, Mark and Jay Briscoe. Kenny King beat Kushida to win the World Television Championship. Silas Young beat Jay Lethal in a last man standing match. The Motor City Machine Guns, Alex Shelley and Chris Sabin beat the Young Bucks, Matt and Nick Jackson to win the World Tag Team Championship. And World Champion Cody beat Never Openweight Champion Minoru Suzuki. On WWE Main Event, Heath Slater beat Dash Wilder, and Lince Dorado and Mustafa Ali beat Tony Nese and Arya Davari. On New Japan, Destruction in Kobe, Hirai Kawato and Hiroyoshi Tenzan beat Katsuya Kitamura and Tomoyuki Oka. Tiger Mask, Jushin Thunder Liger, Kogi Makabe, and Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Champions Funky Future, Ricochet, and Ryusuke Taguchi beat Taka Michinoku, El Desperado, Taichi, Yoshinobu Kanemaru, and Takashi Izuka. Yoshihashi and Haruki Goto beat Chase Owens and Bad Luck Fale. Beretta beat Yojiru Takahashi 
Pesci. The Killer Elite Squad, Davy Boy Smith Jr. and Lance Archer beat War Machine, Raymond Rowe and Hanson, and the Gorillas of Destiny, Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa, in a three-way match to win the Heavyweight Tag Team Championship. Intercontinental Champion Hiroshi Tanahashi and Michael Elgin beat David Finley and Kota Ibushi. Rocky Romero, Toru Yano and Tomohiro Ishii beat Tetsuya Naito and Never Openweight Six-Man Tag Team Champions Bushi and Sonata. Heavyweight Champion Kazushika Okada and Will Ospreay beat Never Openweight Six-Man Tag Team Champion Evil and Hiromu Takahashi. And United States Champion Kenny Omega beat Juice Robinson. On the WWE No Mercy kickoff, Elias beat Apollo Crews. On WWE No Mercy, Intercontinental Champion The Miz beat Jason Jordan. Raw Tag Team Champions Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose beat Sheamus and Cesaro. Finn Balor beat Bray Wyatt. Raw Women's Champion Alexa Bliss beat Sasha Banks, Bayley, Emma, and Nia Jax in a fatal five-way match. Roman Reigns beat John Cena. Enzo Amore beat Neville to win the Cruiserweight Championship. And Universal Champion Brock Lesnar Lesnar beat Braun Strowman. On Ring of Honor TV, Josh Woods beat QT Marshall, and Frankie Kazarian won an Honor Rumble to become the number one contender to the World Championship. On WWE Raw, Matt Hardy and Jason Jordan beat The Miz Taraj, Curtis Axel, and Bo Dallas. Elias beat Apollo Crews. Braun Strowman fought Kurt Hawkins to a no contest and then laid out an open challenge, which Dean Ambrose answered. Braun Strowman then beat Raw Tag Team Champion Dean Ambrose. Raw Tag Team Champion Seth Rollins beat Sheamus. Roman Reigns beat Intercontinental Champion champion The Miz in a non-title match, Finn Balor beat Goldust, and Sasha Banks and Bayley beat Emma and Nia Jax. On WWE SmackDown Live, Baron Corbin beat Ty Dillinger, The Usos, Jimmy and Jay Uso beat The Hype Bros, Zack Ryder and Mojo Rawley, Charlotte Flair beat Carmella, and Kevin Owens beat Sami Zayn when the referee stopped the match. On WWE 205 Live, Akira Tozawa beat Tony Nese, and Neville beat Arya Davari. And that's all for this week's Wrestling Results Roundup. Yeehaw! All right, so let's get into the wrestling review. I'm Mike, alongside with the founder of Pro Wrestling Almanac, Tristan. Our co-host, Chad, is out sick. So how you doing, buddy? Yeah, pretty good. I'm a little tired. That seems to be a common thing with theme with me lately since, oh, I, started, uh, since I started running and stuff again. I, like, I know the feeling, man. Now I know how you felt when you had to drive back from... Oh, yeah. uh, the May Young. I just got back from Vegas this afternoon after that hockey game on uh, mm-hmm. on Tuesday night, which was great because the Kings won three to two. So all is yep. well in my world. Well, by the way, happy happy birthday yesterday. Thank you. Appreciate it. It was a good time. Wife took me out to Vegas for the uh, the week Monday Tuesday. Came home and it was a really good time. So. I uh, definitely, definitely enjoyed it. So other than that, how's everything else going with you? I'm pretty good. Going to be starting work here in a couple of weeks finally. So, Well, that's always good. Yeah. It's necessary. It's long overdue. Yes. Yes, it is. So, um, well, let's get into our first topic. Uh, Cody uh, signs a long-term contract with Ring of Honor. Uh, this definitely is going to put the rumors that he might show up at Starcade with his brother to rest. So I obviously don't um, think that's going to happen. Well, I mean, again, unless it's, it's, unless they cut a deal. Yeah, exactly. It, it's not unheard of. So um, I would say it's entirely possible that we see it. We see a trade of Cody Rhodes appearing at Starcade in exchange for the Rhodes name. Uh, I would like to see that. I, I just, I don't under, and I, and I know WWE is notorious for doing it with, with registering and copywriting their wrestlers names. Well, they need to, it's, it's their intellectual no, and, property. And, it's smart business. And I, I get that, but you know, Dusty Rhodes, that was never 
trademarked to my knowledge by the WWE. Um, that's yes, why but Cody Rhodes was. Cody Rhodes has only appeared as Cody Rhodes in WWE. In WWE. So he he could go be Cody Reynolds. And yes. it's not like people don't know who he is. Yeah, well, so, exactly. I mean, Dust, Dustin has never gone by Dustin Rhodes that I remember. It was sure, always yes. Dustin. When, when in was that? WCW. He was okay. Dustin Rhodes when he first showed up in WWF. And That's right. And he was Dustin Rhodes then, too. That's right. Well, it's uh, it's going to be good for him. He's no longer a free agent, so uh, can't wait to see what he does. I mean, he's already gone through uh, just a long list of what he had considered his dream matchups. Yeah. So now just to see that he's finally at home. And if I remember from reading uh, the articles that this this is domestic exclusivity only. Right. He, well, He's, he can still appear for like New Japan. Exactly. So he's still going to be in the Bullet Club and, and all of that's going to be going on. Right. So, uh, uh, But um, he the way that they did it is that they had him sign his contract at their TV taping this past Saturday. And okay. So that will uh, that will be part of uh, TV, likely two weeks from Sunday this past. Sunday. Okay. Uh, WWE is now reporting that Paige is back at the Performance Center, getting ready uh, to possibly make an in-ring uh, re-debut uh, that she's been out for over a year. It's yeah. been so. No, well, not only that, but she's been cleared to return to the ring. Well, exactly, so, which is huge. Yeah, it's it. You know, people people will go to the Performance Center and work out all the time. If you yes. work for WWE, that's one of the uh, little perks, I suppose. But the uh, the fact that she's cleared to return to the ring is uh, is great, except for the, uh, the interesting little tidbit that they're moving her to SmackDown, despite her having been drafted to Raw uh, last year. I just think it makes more sense with her going to SmackDown. I when do. I'm looking, when I look at everything that's going on in the Raw roster... I just don't see a place for her and moving her over to SmackDown. I mean, that brings her in and we don't know, you know, if and even when she shows back up, if she's going to be a heel, a face, what have you. It's still going to reconnect her with Charlotte and Becky. Right. That she's been working with for a very long time. So I'm excited to see her come back. I've always liked her. She she's a good worker. Mm -hmm. She's always been entertaining in the ring. Uh, hopefully all of the personal stuff is behind her and she can just come back in and focus on performing. But well, we I'm, haven't I'm heard excited. anything about her, you know, about her and uh, El Patron for a while. So that's good. Another yeah. thing, amazingly, that we have, there was no impact news this week. <laughs> Uh, actually there was that I saw, it was a little brief tidbit It from the article I read and it came out a little late, but it looks like impact may be relocating their, their operation and yeah. basing it out of Canada. That's been, that's been, uh, talked about for a while. So I don't so, think that was anything new, but there wasn't, okay. you know, I mean, we oh, had yeah, a yeah. Not, any not like kind of been... uh, implosion going on. Like it's been over the past, what month? Oh. Uh, Oh, yeah. Every week, no, it, something new. Oh, just it's been it's been brutal over there. So, you know, thankfully we haven't had one of those problems going on. Yeah. Um, here, here's here's one that, and I don't know what is going on, but Enzo just got destroyed by the two hundred five roster after Raw went off the air on Monday. Oh man, and it was beautiful. Um, it wasn't just the 205 Live roster either. So, well, so you Braun know, he Strowman. had the no contact order for his ceremony. Yes. And anybody who violated that would not, would not be able to get a title shot. So Neville didn't care. They He tried to leave. They blocked him. The two, whole 205 Live roster, Neville beat the bejesus out of him. And then... After the show went off the air, then Braun Strowman came out, and then the 205 Live roster uh, took some liberties. And one interesting thing that I that I saw was Mustafa Ali was going to go up to hit the 054. Yes. And uh, Drew Gulak stopped him stopped because him that's his whole first. thing. Yeah. Exactly. And no then, no high flying, yeah. the no fly zone. Right. And then, and then, he, then said, he said, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, do it. This guy deserves that, it. 
that was that was just pretty. And you know what? It, it's getting into that whole, you know, back when you and I, you know, hung out all the time. We had the air. The, I mean, the attitude era. And this is what's now starting to become what people are calling the reality era. Right. I mean, they're starting to bring in and and a lot of stories from backstage where and by all accounts Enzo is just receiving a ton of heat backstage yep. uh, just from the way he is his his boasting it, no one likes the guy just right. from what we keep reading and now they're actually bringing it into the storyline to an extent I mean he's, to an extent. he's cheated he's cheated a lot of the cruiserweights out they have reasons for on screen oh, for disliking the guy totally but, one thing that Enzo Amore has done is made 205 Live must-see TV. He has. The and only that's thing that impressive. The only thing that gets me is that with them, and it, it's perceived that the way he was talking, and of course what he did on 205 Live, that he's now going with a full heel run. Sure seems that way. I just don't. I just. I don't know. It, it doesn't make sense to me because normally heels don't cut the kind of promos that Enzo is notorious for. Like they all. The rock. They also, huh? Like The Rock or Stone Cold. There, there were only a handful. It's not. It's not like all of them yeah, do that. But Enzo. As far as his ability to talk, he is totally right up there with those guys. I, I the get best it. of the best. I get it. It just I don't know how much he's gonna be able to to do or say before he just runs out of stuff to say. I mean, well, that's not a huge roster for him, and he already went off on everyone right. on Monday. But so, if you if you look at his actions and what he did to Neville. He cornered Arya Davari, and then after Neville made Arya Davari submit, Enzo came to the ring with his crutch and just destroyed Neville. Oh, definitely. Definitely. One thing I can say, I was, when I saw that this morning, uh, I, I woke up went on Facebook and WWE had posted the after Ross segment. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things I normally do on a segment like that is I, I like to go in and I like to read the notes and that segment for the majority of the, the posts I was reading that didn't go over well. A lot of people were really angry with that segment, especially with the WWE's, uh, that whole thing they do on the anti-bullying campaign. And a lot of people were like, way to kill that one. You know, here it is. You guys talk about not being a bully. And then you have the entire 205 live roster go out and beat the ever living crap out of him. Right. It, it's just one of those things where for you and me, I loved seeing it. I also love the fact that this is now the second time, and I want to see where they're going to go with this, that Braun Strowman has come out to help Neville. I don't know if they're going to eventually do – I mean, because once again, what's the reason for him to be out there? Because Neville is his exact clone in every way except one-eighth his size. Exactly. Well, I mean, exactly. <laughs> I just – I would love to see them team the two up for something – get a stable with the two of them possibly i it's just to bring him out what was it two weeks in a row to go after enzo yeah now is he is he there to help neville or is he there to murder enzo i i say a little bit of both so <laughs> i mean well by the way did you see did you see kurt hawkins shoulder no nah. Oh, take a look at it online when you I'll get a chance. To. They um, they posted his a picture of his shoulder, rear shoulder area from where he hit the screen and it's just line after line after line of just cut marks. Jeez. So, he well, he he really got messed up on that one. So, check this out. Um, we were talking about the Bullet Club earlier. And I found this uh, this news story that, you know, I don't know if you saw the uh, Bullet Club invasion of Raw. 
or no, I the Bullet not. Club invasion of the Citizens Bank Arena parking lot. No, I did not. Really all I, that was my but. my friend posted a picture. He was at that raw. One of the guys I know uh, at Citizens Bank because that's where we all are for hockey with right. Ontario, and it was really cool. They mentioned the rain on a raw podcast. I was happy, um, but he posted pictures. But that's all I know of. Yeah. So apparently now. WWE has sent a cease and desist order to the Young Bucks demanding that they stop using the too sweet hand gesture. Um, And so WWE says that because they're using it for merchandise that WWE owns the, the copyright for it. And they're they're going to have the uh, the Young Bucks. They're trying to get them to sign a written agreement saying they won't do it anymore or face up to a hundred, $150,000 or more in damages. I don't know about that one. It, it, it That one to me kind of seems like they're grasping at straws because um, that's been used all over the place, not just exclusively to WCW, WWE. Right, but the Young Bucks are pretty uh, uh, pretty straightforward with the fact that they're ripping off DX. Yeah, no, I, I, I get what you're saying. They do suck it, and they do... Uh, they do all of that. See, now that one I could understand because I truly think the WWE does have that copyrighted uh, for merchandising purposes. I don't know about the hand gesture because I've never seen any WWE or WCW merchandise with that hand gesture on it. Well, sure, they've never because they've had NWO pictures with the guys doing it. Yeah, well, yeah, but I mean that's an NWO picture, and NWO right. is trademarked by WWE. I get that, but just because that's in the photo doesn't mean that the too sweet hand gesture is copyrighted. Well, I mean, I'm not a lawyer. We'll have to see how that one turns out. Yeah, uh, no, definitely. Another uh, another fun little one. Well, not so fun. Uh, Bully Ray might be done or he, it might be a work or it, I don't know. <laughs> well, he, he he showed up on a podcast with David LaGreca and LaGreca during the – well, sorry, after the interview basically said that Ray didn't sound like his usual self, uh, stated that – Part of the reasons is because the doctors have told him to try and not get excited or to right. be around anything too loud. Right. But supposedly after that pay-per-view, uh, he spent the night in the hospital. Supposedly. Supposedly. Um, now, I mean, there. If you look, if you look at the bump, the the corner of the table seemed to hit him right on the temple, and uh, not softly. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's really kind of Well, but we also also have to look at who it is. I mean, it's not like he hasn't taken, I mean, all of the years in ECW. Oh, yeah. He's had concussion after concussion. He's had, exactly. So, I mean, he could be in that scenario where even if it's a light enough hit, it's enough to cause a big enough concussion to where he might not recover. I mean, right. we'll, we'll eventually see what's going on uh, with future tapings for, for Ring of Honor. But until then, let's just hope he's OK. Right. Let's hope it's not too serious. I Absolutely. mean, I don't I don't and I never have never will. I don't want to see any wrestler, you know, get hurt, you know, or have to retire because of, you know, an in-ring accident. No, that'd be, I, it's, I, it's the last thing you want. Exactly. And it doesn't matter who it is, even if it's a wrestler that I absolutely cannot stand. But, you know, that's because you can't stand them as a performer. You have no idea who they are as a person. Well, exactly. You wish an injury upon upon them. You're not wishing it on the performer. You're wishing it on the person. Exactly. No, definitely. Definitely. So, um, well, let's get into the big WWE pay-per-view. No mercy. So we started off with the kickoff. Well, really quick, before we get into the kickoff. Okay. Originally, I had stated that I would have killed to have been at that pay-per-view. Right. I'll be honest with you. When that pay-per-view was over, for the amount of hype that that pay-per-view had going into it, I would not have been happy if I would have paid close to $200 to get tickets to take Taylor 
to go home after that pay-per-view. I mean, for me, there was only one match. I mean, there was one match that I think was the match of the evening. I don't know if you and I are on the same page. Tag team match, of course we are. It was the tag team match, exactly. I was very, very disappointed in the John Cena-Roman Reigns match, and I just... Uh, there was something missing with the Strowman Lesnar match. So, I, I just. So let me tell you, I've got a friend who you know him, Dave. He, oh yeah. He was uh, he was there. Okay. And he, I asked him. I said, uh, I said, was the uh, was the John Cena Roman Reign, Reigns match. Uh, as bad in person as it was on TV. And he said, no, in fact, it was great in person. The crowd was way into it. So that's, I I mean, something didn't come across on TV because, uh, well, I think a lot of it has to do, and, and it, it comes down to a lot of sporting events. I mean, I know people who tell me that there's no way in hell they could ever watch hockey on television, but they show up to a game and they're like, oh my God, it's the greatest thing ever. Right. I just think, you know, the, the big difference is where you and I are sitting at home and we were texting during that entire Absolutely. match. I mean, after every during high pretty spot, much the I entire think, show. Well, exactly. I mean, every high spot, we're sitting here going, please, for the love of God, let this be the last one, you know, just get this match over with. It was a very slow moving match until the very end. But it just I don't know, something didn't come off well in in that performance. I I didn't think it was a great match. Um, The ending to that match when Reigns left and left Cena in there, it left a lot of questions to be answered. So we'll get to that in just a little bit. But yeah, let's get let's get to the kickoff show. Okay. Uh, Elias defeated Apollo Cruz. Yeah, a whole lot of nothing. I mean, yeah, it, I just don't know where they're going with this Elias character. It just he's winning. I well, exactly that. That's the only thing. I mean, that's that's the one thing that's confusing me even more. I just I don't see where the character is going, but. He hasn't lost a match. Well, he has. Well, in a long time. Yeah, but, I mean, since... he, he beats... I mean, Apollo Crews is a jobber to the stars now, sadly. He should it be. He's, he's way better than that. But that's where he is. That's his place in the WWE right now. And he's good at it. But Elias beat him. And then he beat him again on Raw. So yes. they... They do know that at a certain point they have to maintain momentum. Otherwise, the person's going to lose all the heat that they've gotten. So they're doing that with Elias for right now, and it seems to be working. He gets good heat with the crowd. He gets good reactions. He has a unique gimmick. He does. The fact that he plays the guitar... Poorly, he's not good. No, but he's not. I mean, he he plays better than I do. Um, and he's not a great he's, singer, he's, but he's got a he's good like, enough voice. He's, he's like the Ramones. He, he's like the Ramones. He knows three chords, and that's about yeah. it. Well, and he uh, he's like he's a street performer, and that's that's yeah. his, his gimmick, and it works. And somehow he's managed to to make this entertaining. And the only the only problem that I have is that the talking bad about the city that you're in thing is just cheap heat. Well, it's it's old. I mean, it's it is. It's a classic. It, That's why they keep. Well, doing it, it is a classic. I mean, it's like you know, showing up to Cleveland, Ohio, wearing a Baltimore Ravens jersey, or Jerry Lawler uh, is, and, and Jerry Lawler is a Browns fan and did that. Oh yeah, no, exactly. I mean, it's 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 an age old, easy, cheap way to get heat, um, but. It's, it still works. It's it's one of those tried and true. For for us, you know, we've seen it so much. It doesn't really do anything. Right. But you get a crowd together, and you know, I don't care. You know, except for maybe me. You start bowed mouthing Los Angeles, and I'm sitting there going, "Yep, I'm right there with you, buddy. I yep. get it." That's what I you was know, doing when we were watching where, it. 
yeah, where everybody else is sitting there going, oh, you know, boo, boo. And it's like, oh, none of you like this place either. You're just stuck here. So, so I have a I question think it's, for you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, if you were to wear an Oklahoma City Thunder jersey in Seattle, you would get heat. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What would happen if you wore a Seattle Supersonics jersey in Oklahoma? Nothing. You don't think so? Nope. Nothing, because truthfully, people in Oklahoma City don't give a damn. They took the team. It's a great example. If you look, and I'll go with a quick hockey. There, there are a couple. There, maybe there's a couple exceptions because hockey fans are a little bit more, and it goes more back to the if you go to the place where you took the team versus moving. So a great example: the New Jersey Devils. They moved to New Jersey in, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was the late 80s. But they've relocated two times in their history. They started off in Kansas City, and then they moved to Colorado and became the Colorado Rockies in the 70s. And then they moved to uh, New Jersey. The Dallas Stars were originally the Minnesota North Stars. And they relocated. So it happens all the time. Yep. You know, and people wear. I mean, I'll go to I'll go to games in Arizona. And Arizona, I'm trying to remember, they relocated from Winnipeg. That's where it was. Now Winnipeg got a team back eventually, but you know that history actually carried over with the team. They have retired jerseys in those rafters from players that played for Winnipeg that never played for Arizona. It's really weird how that happens in sports. But there are people that go to Arizona Coyotes games that wear Winnipeg Jets jerseys. For or, you know, players that used to play for Winnipeg. There are people that go to Dallas games that wear North Star jerseys. People that go to, you know, Devils games that wear Kansas City Scouts or uh, Colorado Rockies jerseys. So if you showed up in Oklahoma City and you wear, I mean, maybe they'd laugh at you because you're you're representing a team that that our city took from you. But I don't think it would gain any heat. You know, but yeah, if you show up in an OKC jersey and you're going into a match in Seattle, right. that's going to draw given. some heat. So I just I it it works one way. I just it doesn't work the other. I mean, you go you've been to I, well I don't know I mean I have but you've, you've put been to way more, you games. put way more thought into this answer than I expected. So yeah, well, I'm you just know, sitting here listening and enjoying it. You know, it's just like I said. You go to Dodger games and there are people that wear Brooklyn Dodger hats. Yeah two L.A. Dodger games, yet they haven't been in Brooklyn since 58. But again, they recognize that history. Exactly. They do. So, um, yeah, it's it. Like I said, it works one way. It doesn't work the other. So let's get on to the next match. Remember, the Minnesota Lakers moved to Los Angeles where they don't have any lakes. Minneapolis Lakers. Where they don't have any lakes. Where they don't. Well, the New Orleans Jazz moved to Salt Lake City where they don't allow music. Well, and then you had the. uh, Wow. (laughs) Yeah. It- <laughs> you just killed my whole joke. And it's not even my oh. joke. It's Trey Parker and Matt Stone's joke from basketball. Oh. Let's, yeah. Well, there's. Let's go ahead oh. and move on. Oh, man. <laughs> it Good times. All right. Well, yeah. next match uh, was the single match for the WWE Intercontinental Championship. Uh, the Miz with Bo Dallas and Curtis, Ax- Ugh, Curtis Axel, the Miz Taraj, uh, defeated Jason Jordan. Uh, I. I'm, I continue to be impressed by Jason Jordan. I've always liked the guy since he was part of American Alpha, and I used to watch him at old SCW shows, and I've met him. And oh, yeah. He's a nice kid, and he, he works hard. Uh, a lot of people were questioning the wisdom of putting him with Kurt Angle instead of Chad Gable, who's a little more charismatic, and et cetera, yes. et cetera. And my, my thought is, why would you want to put the more charismatic guy with the charismatic guy? That was like putting CM Punk with Paul Heyman. Doesn't yeah. Need, doesn't need the mouthpiece. Jason Jordan does. So putting him with Kurt Angle is a good idea. I don't um, I don't know how the angle itself is working, but he continues to get over in his matches. He had the matches with – the successive matches with John Cena and then Roman Reigns. And the crowd seemed to really get on board with him. And then he's going against The Miz and they – go the other direction so uh i think i think we're in a same similar situation with roman reigns as we were with roman reigns where wwe's like hey we're gonna push this guy and the crowd's like no you're not 
You know, I I, uh, I disagree with you a little bit on that one for one reason. I just think we've gotten to the point where we need to get the IC title off of the Miz. And the only reason I say this is because I think people have gotten to the point where they, they just enjoy the Miz too much as an IC champion. And people have kind of looked at that championship as of lately as the Miz's championship. No one else deserves that title. He needs to move up. Uh, he's done so well over the last couple of years. The guy needs a push for e- for either get him in the universal game for the universal con- uh, universal championship, or put him back over on SmackDown and let him go for the WWE championship. I just think, you know, Jason Jordan, the guy's a hell of a worker. I mean, when he does Northern Lights, that is just a- an amazing move to watch. Uh, he's very solid in ring. I just think that anybody right now going up against The Miz, it's just destined to go nowhere because everybody is enjoying The Miz too much as the IC champion. Which isn't... And that's the only thing that I'm leaning towards is that, you know, because you and I have said it. I mean, we would love he's had a great long run. I mean, what? He's now the third longest combined reigning IC champion in the history of the WWE. Yeah, behind Morocco and Morales. Morales, yes. And so I just think we've gone to that point where he's had that title for so long. And the people who have taken it from him have had it for such a short period of time that we haven't had that opportunity to see anybody else. So I. I just think, you know, if if we do get the IC title off of the Miz, you're going to get more people going in for it. Move the Miz somewhere else. Get him in a different storyline. I think Jason Jordan can go somewhere. I just don't know where they're going to go with the Kurt Angle storyline. Right. That's the only thing. I think they're going to keep the belt on the Miz for the uh, the time being. Um he's... They're probably going to keep the they're probably truthfully going to keep the belt on him until has to go out for maternity leave. Um, I I don't know. That's that's a long time. Uh, I, only- I I think that they're going to keep it on him um, until he, uh, until there's really somebody that could take it from him. And they're trying to they're doing the same thing on SmackDown with AJ Styles and the U.S. title is that they're trying to reestablish the prestige for the belt. And in order to do that, you have to have a strong champion hold the belt for a good while. Definitely. And, like, if you look at uh, Triple H in 2003, yeah, a lot of people hated his run with the World Heavyweight Championship. He was holding people down, or they think he was holding people down. He probably was. And the, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that by the time... Chris Benoit won that title. Triple H had held it for almost for for a year and a half, with the exception of like three months. And that belt meant something at that point. It wasn't Definitely. just a rehash of the World Heavyweight Title. It wasn't just oh hey, here's a belt we had, and we're gonna give it to Triple H. Yeah. So. That I think that that's what they're doing here with The Miz, and it seems to be working, especially with the way that he's playing the role of the champion. He feels underappreciated. He feels under exposed, underbooked, and he goes to Angle about it, and Angle's like, well, since you want this, we'll your opponent will be determined in a battle royal or a six-pack challenge or whatever, and it's going to continue to be so. And I think that where they're going with this Jason Jordan, Kurt Angle thing is that either they're going to do a heel turn with one or both. Either Jordan's going to turn heel because he's getting frustrated that he can't get anywhere, he's going to try to use his influence, or that he's getting frustrated that people are saying that he's only where he is because of who his dad is, and that's going to go that way. 
I, you know, the one thing that I can see going into the future, and it, and it all goes down to the rumors as to what we might see at WrestleMania, is we'll eventually see that Jason Jordan has gotten tired of all of the, the crap and stuff that's being said about him, and he sides with Triple H. And that's how you end up getting the Triple H uh, feud with yeah. Kurt Angle. Nah. Not you never know. Not appealing to me. I I agree. I just I just I don't know. I just I don't see this storyline going anywhere. So uh, let's move on. Uh, Finn Balor versus Bray Wyatt. Finn Balor gets a much needed win. Uh, um, decent match. Nothing spectacular. No, it, it wasn't. You know, the one thing that, that I did come away with from this match and also from uh, Monday Night Raw, uh, I didn't get to watch Raw with my daughter because, of course, I was in Vegas and she was also very unhappy with me because right. Raw was literally 15 minutes from the house and we could have gone. But uh, she she asked the question, why does he basically have the same entrance when he's just Finn Balor that he does as the demon? And it, it made me really think about it. Why doesn't... I, I know he didn't used to, but why, since he went up to the main roster, have they used the same entrance for him But no matter what he does? Couldn't tell you. I just I would love to see because we don't see the demon that often and the demon is supposed to be special when he does it. And I just wish they would go back to that separate demon entrance that he had, you know, dating back to his days in NXT. So, well, I think it might be a uh, an issue trying to simplify things for the fans. You know what I mean? Like back when uh, when Lance Cade was teaming with Mark Jindrak, they called him Garrison Cade because they had Lance Storm on the roster and they didn't want to have people two Lances, the same name. right? Yeah, and that's the same reason why Greg Shane Helms became Gregory Helms because yeah, because of Shane McMahon. And so they, I mean, they seem to have gotten away with it, but Vince always has the keep it simple mentality and yeah that seems to be in my at least in my opinion what's going on going on here is that they have the they say the same entrance but they still do the demon music yes yeah I don't know. It was just a thought. So um, next match, we had what you and I both considered the match of the evening. Definitely uh, would be in the running for me as tag match of the year. Uh, Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins defeat uh, Sheamus and the Toothless Wonder, Cesaro. Oh, my gosh. I mean, for you the just... rest of the night, any anytime anybody hit the ring post, I was like, check the teeth. Oh, now, you know, here's the funny thing, and, and we'll get into the match in a minute, but do you really think after a scenario like that, because we never really saw that that kind of an accident happen. Sure, we have. To, not, a, not well, I mean, Natty, Natty's knocked out some teeth. Brutus Clayton um, to Neville, Mick Foley in the Hell in a Cell. It happened to Edge. It's happened to Val Venus. No, 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 no. I, I, people have lost teeth, but what I'm saying is. Knocked into their jaw like, like Cesaro. But because of that design now for the ring post, that's what I'm talking about. Not not people losing teeth. I mean, I know that's happened all the time, but I'm saying because of that design, that ring post is a lot larger than it used to be and a lot closer to the, the turnbuckle. I mean, he's taken Do that bump a bunch of times and it's never happened. So yeah, I think I don't it know. was just one of those. It was just a one of those near wrong miss place, scenarios. wrong yeah, was, time. You know, yeah. it was just a he. Uh, I, we look at look at Seth Rollins with uh, Finn Balor, and then with uh, Sting. You know, I mean, he uh, or with Sting, and then with Finn Balor, where he was. A lot of people were regarding him as an unsafe worker when it wound up being two completely same move, but it was yeah. just freak accidents. Oh, yeah. who has he hurt since? Nobody. 
yeah exactly um but no i mean that was a hell of a match yes um definitely match of the night and the the fact that cesaro was we'll say injured for a good chunk of the match you know you know i mean his adrenaline was pumping so he probably wasn't feeling too much Oh, of course. But, um, I mean, I think the worst thing about that was, you say you could hear it. Well, I mean, it just sounded like him smacking the ring post to me. It didn't, but when you, when you saw the blood come spurting out right when he hit, that was rough. And I don't think I can recall something like that being so vivid. Maybe when uh, CM Punk got his head split open by the barber chair. That was pretty bad. Yeah. But um, the fact that Cesaro was injured through most of the match, still managed to do hit all the key spots, was getting punched in the face, took a broke kick to the face. Like, the guy's a boss. He is. And um, I, I was a big fan of the pairing of Sheamus and Cesaro, not not because of the two of them, but because of the logic of them getting the draw in the best of seven series and their their evolution as a team has been so perfect. Well, and and very natural too. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't feel it doesn't feel forced. That's, it doesn't that's exactly feel like what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Is that it? Just it it. It, it doesn't feel forced. It is natural. Exactly what you said. And so... the I, and then, I enjoy watching them. Yeah. And then Ambrose and uh, Rollins are, are both are both strong talents. And a couple, of the, uh, a couple of the best matches that I've seen in WWE this year have involved Sheamus and Cesaro. So that should, oh, I mean... Definitely. Against different teams. So that should tell you who the common denominator is. Oh yeah, they definitely should go down, you know, as, as tag team of the year uh, I, I for, think they for have what to. they definitely. All right, well, we'll go on to our next match, fatal five way match for the Raw Women's Championship. Alexa Bliss defeated Bailey, Emma, Nia Jax, and Sasha Banks. That was another one that I thought was was good, not great. It yeah, it did what it needed to do. It it got. It, it showed what a threat Nia Jax was, so got her over as a monster even more so than she already was. It uh, it teased the split between Bailey and Sasha, which needs to happen. It, well, and they even carried that over a little bit into Raw. Right. It got uh, it got Alexa Bliss a really an, another good win, but she continues to play the she's not playing the uh, chicken shit heel, but she's a sneaky heel. She gets, oh, yeah. she's very opportunistic, like Edge was, where she'll come in and she'll steal the pin to win the match, yep. and that's what happened. And I mean, granted, she hit her own DDT, but Bailey was already weakened. Oh yeah, I still still for me one of the funniest parts of the match and and I was laughing was when she tried to, you know, put her DDT on Naya and just Naya stops it in midair with this uh uh-uh, uh sorry. Yep. Um Naya's a beast. I mean that I enjoy she took watching. off the apron was crazy. Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, it's a fatal five way let's be honest. I mean Anything over a triple threat match is a very tough match to to do effectively. I mean, there's there's a lot of players involved. A lot can happen, uh, and things can get off script and off plan pretty quickly, depending on you know what's going on. So, I mean, like like you said, it was a good match. It, it was solid. I don't know if it could have been any better, but uh, definitely, I I didn't have a problem with the outcome of this one. Yeah, neither did I. And I, I mean, we, we said it last week, if, uh, it, or me and Chad anyway, if Bailey doesn't win, Alexa will win. Yeah. You that know. was, that was, that's why I said that I, I had three and a half matches right. Well, we ended up, what did, I ended up going, well, we both went four for two. Four for th- on, four and three. Four and three, that's right. We both went four and three. Yeah. Uh, for the evening. So, um, Next match, we've already kind of talked about this a little bit, but Roman Reigns defeats John Cena. Yeah, do we have to talk about it again? <laughs> um, this match, I'm, I'm sorry, like, 
it, they were moving longest in slow motion. Match, longest match of the evening, too. I mean, it and came in at 22 minutes and five like seconds. It. Totally. And it was it felt like they were moving in slow motion um they were pandering to the crowd they would the like you said the 50 50 spots <laughs> well yeah yeah I, I had sent you a text that basically said you know i understand wwe with the 50 50 booking on wins but when the hell did we go 50 50 on spots during a match yep. um i mean it was it was literally uh, the the best thing if if i was to play that match in slow motion to music literally the only song that i would play during that entire match would be the song anything you can do i can do better <laughs> i mean that's i mean that's what this basically was well, and my I just, uh, I, my big issue with the match was that it it came in with so much hype and it was like they didn't even try to live up well to it. What really got me more than anything than the match itself was the after No Mercy show. Yeah, Raw Talk. And at that and at that point, you know, when John Cena starts talking, I'm literally at this point sitting there going, once again, a Roman a, a Roman Reigns win that is forced. It doesn't seem natural. I mean, you know, Cena basically said, you know, he's he's and he had been a part timer, but now he's going to be more than just a part timer. I mean, he's going to be a uh, every once in a blue moon show up for WrestleMania. When they shine the bat signal, he said. Yeah, when when they shine the bat signal, you know, I'll show up. And it, it literally, it was one of those where I'll be honest, I still don't think. Even he is sold on Roman Reigns being the guy. I mean, I know he said he does, but just from reading body language and the way he was talking, it's almost like he didn't believe, you know, what was coming out of his own mouth. Okay, so, you know, you know how I am about the Roman Reigns hate. I I do. I don't. I'm not the biggest fan of the guy, but I'm not either. And I picked him to win this match, by the way. Yeah. I'm not the biggest fan of the guy, but I think that a lot of the hate that he gets is really unjustified. It's people, like I said, it's people throwing little temper tantrums. Oh, yeah. uh, Because they're not getting what they want. So Reigns is the brunt of it and doesn't know how to deal with it as well as a John Cena yet. Um, Well, I mean, a great example is Monday Night Raw. I mean, his his segment with The Miz, it just was a weak segment on his part. I just did not I think. Disagree. I disagree. I thought he was pretty strong. And he's at his best when he's kind of a casual, cocky, uh, not heel, but just casual, excuse me, casual and cocky. See, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the reverse on that. I just, I think he's better when he's just this big beast who doesn't say shit. I, I, I mean, I'm, to be brutally honest, I don't like listening to him talk. Right. I don't like I listening you. to him cut a promo. And, you know, and that's, that's, of course, you're right. I'm just saying that the point I was trying to get to was what did Roman Reigns really do to make that match well, and we work? Uh, say, say that again. Go ahead. Sorry. What was it? that Roman Reigns did that made that match not work? I, You know, I don't know. I mean, I don't think Cena... I mean, we can ask the same question. What did Cena do Nothing. to make that match work? The exactly. reason that match did not work was because of Cena, not because of Reigns. Which is rare for Cena, though. Cena... Um, really phoned it in, and which and Reigns is taking the heat because he's Reigns. Yeah, but in my opinion, the reason that match failed was because the guy who was responsible for getting the crowd involved chose not to. But that leads me back to now we go deeper into this once again in the way he talked after and in the way he wrestled. 
it even John Cena will do whatever Vince wants him to do. I mean, he is a company man, but I truly felt from watching that match and watching his reaction when that match was over that he does not feel that Roman Reigns is deserving of being the guy. I don't know. I think you're reading a little bit too much into it. Uh, you know, I, I might be. You know, you never know. Seeing, I, I just, think you're seeing what you want to see. Possibly. I mean, and, and like I said, I don't hate Reigns. Yeah. I'm just not a big fan of his. Yeah. But I just, you know, you look at John Cena, and, I mean, he normally puts on great matches with whoever, you know, he's going up against. And this just was not one of those. Well, and Roman Reigns also is not known for really having bad matches. Exactly. So, I mean, who knows? Um, let's let's move over. Next one. Uh, WWE Cruiserweight Championship match. Enzo Amore defeats Neville. Uh, I never thought I would say this, but based off of what we talked about earlier, I am really glad that Enzo Amore is the Cruiserweight Champion. Well, remember, I said the only reason I wanted to see Enzo Amore win the championships was to see what Corey Graves was going to say. Yes. And uh, I am absolutely loving Corey Graves' commentary uh, whenever Enzo is on screen, especially now that he's coming on as the champion. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, that led into, of course, what we saw on Raw the following night. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where they go with this. It definitely makes 205 more relevant. It's just going to be interesting to see what they do. Yes, yes. And if they continue going with this uh, one against all thing that they've got going on right now, I, I'm, I'm digging it, especially if you get a couple of guys trying to suck, suck up to Enzo like Ari Davari did. Yes. It, it definitely it definitely can work that way. Uh, I like what they've done so far. I mean, I wasn't too keen on the idea of Enzo winning the championship, uh, especially coming in, you know, this early. I mean, we're talking about a guy who he's great on the mic, but not that great in the ring, uh, you know, but we'll see. Uh, they're they're going to run with this for a while, I think, and, and we'll definitely see where it goes. But, you know, as long as I get to hear Corey Graves continue talking crap about Enzo and just being extremely happy whenever he gets the crap kicked out of him, li- life's good. So, yeah. Uh, last match of the evening, main event, singles match for the WWE Universal Championship. Brock Lesnar uh, with Paul Heyman in his corner defeats Braun Strowman. All right. This match is getting a lot of hate. It is. Because Brock finished off Braun with one F5. I see see the problem that they've let Ambrose and Cena and other, and Goldberg and other people kick out of the F5, but not Samoa Joe and not Braun. Yep. So yeah. I, I see the issue that people are having. I am not of a like mind. I, I, I really liked the psychology of the match. I liked that Brock could do nothing to keep Braun down, so Brock went to the Kimura, which we have not seen in a while. Since The Undertaker. Right. And and the way that he wore Braun down and then suplexed him again and again. He hit something like seven German suplexes in a row on him. Yeah. And every time, Braun kept getting up slower and slower and slower until he didn't get up at all. And at the end of the day, Brock Lesnar is always Brock Lesnar. Brock is a star. He's a star the likes of which very few can say that they are The Rock, Austin, Cena, um, and Brock Lesnar. They're, yep. it's, it's, it's very, very thin air where Brock lives. And he... Uh, I, obviously, they're trying to go with Brock as the champion until WrestleMania, but I didn't hate on the match. I really, I really didn't. You know, um, my my biggest my biggest problem 
is that with this match, and, and once again, I, I didn't hate on the match, and I was fine with Lesnar finishing off Strowman with one F5. And the reason is, this match is suffering because WWE over the last decade has watered down finishers. I mean, when you and I were growing up and and we were watching wrestling, I mean, when Hogan dropped the leg, when Jake the Snake Roberts did a DDT, you didn't have to see two, three, four, five of them in a match. That finisher was the finisher. When that hit, it was over. I mean, when we're seeing matches now where John Cena is throwing, you know, five, six AAs, is having to now go to a super AA to put a match away. It, they've, they have watered down the finisher. I mean, the DDT has now, depending on who uses it, has become almost a transition move. Well, and it is. But, dude, <laughs> to be fair, you're wrestling evolves so you're talking about uh moves that used to uh that used to finish people that don't anymore you realize that guys in like the 70s used to finish people with an atomic drop oh no i know or a body i know so it just seems like the problem is we're in this transition phase, though, where there are guys that were that were wrestling, you know, 10 years ago, as is the case with a guy like a Brock Lesnar. And he's still wrestling today. You know, that finisher 10 years ago was devastating. I still think it's a devastating finisher because a lot of people don't factor in, you know, to, to, to take a guy like Braun Strowman and throw him over your shoulders like that and spin him around, that's a lot of weight hitting the ground. Yep. I mean, Braun Strowman, and, and that's why I didn't have a problem with it. Braun Strowman taking an F5, the big show taking an F5, that's going to hurt a guy like that legitimately more than if, you know, Brock Lesnar gave Neville an F5. There's not that much body hitting the canvas with that much force. So I didn't have a problem with it. I just think, you know, we see too many finishers in a lot of these matches. So when they finally do go back to the old school my finisher is the one that's going to get it done and it's going to get it done in one shot. That's where people lose it in today's day and age in wrestling. So, yeah, no, ag- agreed. And pe- the same people that complain, that complain about the, uh, uh, the one F five finishing brawn are the same people that complain that people kick out of too many finishers. Yep. And, so, like I said, with like with New Japan, like the matches are almost too good. They get my my heart rate going. Uh, <laughs> that's one of the the only like the only problem that I have is these guys will hit their finisher. Excuse me, these guys will hit their finisher, and they'll kick out again and again and again, and it diminishes the finisher. And so I love that Brock is finishing people with one F5. Well, ex- exactly. I mean, it goes back to, like I said, you talk, you know, Jake the Snake Roberts still talks about it to this day when everybody mine's asks him. Mine's the best because no one ever kicked out of it. No one ever kicked out of mine, you know. Um, so the one thing is, and, and this is something that, you know, before we get into our Ghost of Wrestling Pass segment, I really want to bring up because it really got me on Monday Night Raw. We're at a point right now where the rosters are just so deep. Where are they going to go with everybody? I mean, because like for me, you know, I don't understand how a guy like Braun Strowman does not win the Royal Rumble this year. Yeah. I, I just I don't. But then the question is, what are you gonna do with Reigns? Um, what are you gonna do with Cena? What are you gonna do? What with are you gonna do with Finn Balor? A, AJ Styles, Bray Wyatt, and then 
same thing when I'm looking, you know, I'm watching these women's matches and here it is, you know, we only have one title for the women on Raw and one title for the women on SmackDown. And here it is. I'm watching on Monday Night Raw a tag match between Nia Jax and Emma versus Sasha and Bailey. The and, title's and not even involved. The title's not involved. And it's just like, what's the... I, trust me, I love watching him wrestle, but where are we going with this? Well, okay, we need- so, so check this out. And I, I, I apologize for cutting you off as I do no, no, no. ever so I get often. It. But look at... 205 Live right now. On 205 mm-hmm. Live, you've got the feud between Enzo and Neville. You've got a feud between Rich Swan and TJP. And you've got a feud between uh, what's his name? Cedric Alexander and Brian Kendrick slash Jack Gallagher. Mm-hmm. So the so that's three solid storylines right now. Plus, you've got Enzo versus everyone. And you've got Drew Gulak petitioning for a better 205 Live. Yes. So we are talking about guys that get maybe one segment on Raw. They got the main event segment this week, which is incredible. But yes. They, got, they maybe get one, one or two segments on Raw. They usually have one match on main event. And then they have 205 Live. So you're talking an hour and a half of TV time. And these guys have more coherent storylines going on than the Raw main roster does. Of course. So, the one good thing, well, one of the good things about Vince Russo is Vince Russo did not buy into the idea of creative having nothing for you to do. It's their job to wrestle. It's creative's job to come up with storylines. So he wanted to make sure that everybody on the roster had a role, and he was really good at doing that because look back at the Attitude Era. Every match had something to do with an angle. Every single one. And I'm not saying they need to go back to the Crash TV uh, no, it, but, exactly. But the the idea of and, and I, I want to say it was Brian Gerwitz that did the same thing that he had the whiteboard and he would would like storyboard out storylines so they could keep track of who was doing what. And I just I think that they that's a tremendous attribute and that's something that they need to go back to. If somebody is on the roster, you should have something for them to do. Well it exactly. does not always and, and, you're not always gonna hit. It's not always gonna be a hit. Look at what's no, up. Look it, at what Dolph Ziggler's doing right now. They had they wish. ran out of stuff for him to do. And so they want to keep him on TV. They're paying him a lot of money. They want to keep him on TV. So they've got him doing something. Exactly. Even though it's god awful watching him do what he's doing. But I I, I get it. it. Some people like it. No, no, I know. I just, you know, my thing is, is that, you know, in today's day and age of wrestling, especially on a three hour raw, if you're wrestling on the show and you got a spot on the card I want your match to mean something I want there to be some reason why you guys are are wrestling I mean there literally was no rhyme or reason why Nia Jax and Emma were wrestling Bailey and Sasha other than maybe yeah, they were angry with each other at how things went you know the night before at No Mercy they they just all of a sudden out of nowhere here they are wrestling in a tag match and it's like I need some some reasoning behind it and that's something that is just missing right now I can understand that sometimes for me though the only reasoning that there needs to be is I think I'm better than you and I'm going to prove it 
which I get. So at least at least give me something going into the match, not just we come back from commercial and we have a match between the four of them. At least have a short backstage segment, something where they're talking and it, it, something where, you know, Emma and Nia, because they're both heels, are are pissed at what Bailey and Sasha said, how, you know, we almost had that one. And if it wasn't for Emma and Nia, you know, either one of us could have walked out as as the Raw Women's Champion, and then you have Emma and Nia go. Well, if you guys think you're that's good, you know why don't why don't we take care of this tonight? You two versus us, just something to lead into the match. Fair enough. Okay. Um, so you know what, folks, that's it for this week's wrestling review. Uh, go ahead, check us out on our website, prowrestlingalmanac.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at PW Almanac and on Facebook, Pro Wrestling Almanac. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and on iTunes. And once again, we now can be heard on TuneIn Radio and Google Play. And just so you know, uh, the promotions database is now up to 18 promotions. A good chunk of those are indie promotions that we're adding each week as we cover them in our indie spotlight. And once again, if you guys have a promotion that we haven't heard of, let us know. Get us in touch with them. Uh, we can definitely do them for one of our Indie Spotlight segments and get them up on the webpage. We definitely, we just want to get these Indie promotions as much exposure as possible. And we might not have that much now, but we're hoping to get bigger. And so we can try to... Uh, expose these promotions to a new audience and people in the area maybe even that haven't heard of them. All right. Well, guys, now it's time for us to take a look back into the wrestling history and we're going to be visited by the ghost of wrestling past. You... The spirit whose coming was foretold? I am. Who? What are you? I am the ghost. Wrestling's boss. All right, guys. Uh, this, well, sorry, I'm used to saying guys. Once again, Chad's out sick, so it's just me and Tristan. Uh, this week was my turn. So for the Ghost of Wrestling Past segment, I've decided to take a look back at one of what is probably the most famous nights in wrestling history, and that's January 4th, 1999, for the WCW episode of Monday Nitro. Um. I, I know you joke with me about it. Oh, I wasn't uh, joking. Uh, I, We're not friends anymore for you making me watch that again. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, for being such a and, and, and let's get a little bit of history into this one. Uh, this was a Monday Nitro that was held in the Georgia Dome in Atlanta. Uh, one of your larger crowds that you were going to get for a taping of a live episode because of just the sheer size of that building. It was 38,000 some odd people. Yeah, I mean, that's, it was that's a, it was huge. A, and it was a, well, and it was a small crowd for the Georgia Dome. Oh, no, 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 definitely. Um, that was just a god-awful show to get through. Well, and I think it's 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 very unfortunate because the the matches themselves were very short. Uh, I'm trying to pull it up on the website right now because I just added it to the website, prowrestlingalmanac.com. Cheap plug. It's our featured event as heard on Pro Wrestling Almanac Podcast, which am us. And so you look, and not one match went over 10 minutes. It looks like the longest match was DDP versus Brian Adams. And yet it's a three-hour show. So yeah. It was very, very story-heavy. Well, the, that, opening, that opening segment with, you know, Ric Flair being Bischoff. put in charge, yeah. Bish, that was just long. I mean, they spent close to five minutes watching Ric Flair 
and and the cool thing about it was we got to see now known as Charlotte, but you know his daughter Ashley. We got to see Reed, and we got to see David. You know, but that whole showing up, walking, it, you know, from the parking lot through the entrance, through you know the backstage. I mean, it just it was just drawn out so long. You know, until he finally got into the ring and cut his promo. I mean, how I don't even know how long it was, but it was easily that opening segment was like a 30 minute segment. Um, I mean, if it wasn't, it sure felt like it. Exactly. It just it was tough to get through. Now, some good um, things did come out of that segment, though. One, you got Bischoff sent back to the commentary booth, which I really liked. And they, yes. the fact that they played that up through the entire show with Bischoff just sitting there fell asleep, snoring a little bit, refused to say anything until he started mocking Goldberg. Yes. And then, of course, at the very end, which we will get into. Everybody oh, knows, yeah. if, if you know anything about wrestling, you know what segment we're talking about, but we will get there. Uh, first match of the evening was Hugh Morris uh, defeating Glacier. Match went two minutes and 46 seconds. Are you getting these off of my... Uh my site yes i am awesome i misspelled glacier <laughs> don't worry i i spelt it soma joe last yes, week you, yes so. you did um i'm glad but, that you're uh, using the website because that would kind of defeat the whole purpose of using a podcast to plug a website it it it, it would definitely definitely would um next match after that we had booker t Defeating Emery Hale in a 59 second match. Yeah, and they were, but they were touting uh, Emery Hale's performances on Thunder and Saturday Night and Main Event and how he had been doing well. And then Booker T just smashed him. And I don't know if that was like something to get Booker T over or if this guy was, I mean, his name was Emery Hale. He was never going to be a star. Yeah. But. Um, I'm just kind of wondering what the purpose of building this guy up was if they were just going to have Booker destroy him. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, next match after that, once again, relatively short match. Chavo Guerrero Jr. defeated Norman Smiley via pinfall, four minutes and one second. I was always a big fan of Chavo Jr. in uh, in this time frame in uh, WCW because this uh-huh. is when they were doing the uh, the Pepe gimmick. Yes. And I don't know if this was before or after. They were still talking about Pepe. Uh, I didn't see him come out with Pepe. No. But Norman Smiley was the threw Pepe into a wood chipper and Chavo had like a mental break and almost like he almost jumped into the wood chipper. It was <laughs> phenomenal. But it's just a uh, hobby just a little hobby horse. Yeah. And it was it was great. And I always I always loved that. You know, every everybody's got their stupid angles that they love. That one was mine. Oh yeah, no definitely. Uh next match after okay, that Okay Glacier horse- spelled right now. Oh, there you go. Uh, fourth match of the night, Chris Benoit beat Horace Hogan via submission, three minutes and 59 seconds. Good match. Um, it was a good match. I mean, you know, we've we've discussed it time after time just how good Benoit was in the ring. Horace Hogan wasn't bad either. He was He just, wasn't either. He was very – he was – he had big shoes to fill. He really is Hulk Hogan's nephew. Yes, he, he is. big shoes to fill. And so – he was never going to be that guy, but he had a good look and he was solid in the ring and he had a decent role and he did it. So. Well, yeah, I mean, and it takes it takes a it takes a certain type of guy to come in being a relative, you know, or a direct family member of an icon. I mean, it, it, it not a lot of guys can do it. I mean, not everybody can be Terry Funk or Owen Hart. Uh, or even Randy Orton yeah. for that instance, you know, it's, it's just tough. I mean, where you get, you end up getting guys like Ted DiBiase Jr. Who, you know, they're, they're good for a short period of time. And then they just fizzle out yeah. because they can't live up to the hype right. of, you know, their, their siblings. So well, look at, look at Dusty Rhodes, Dustin Rhodes had to become gold mm-hmm. dust to get away yes. out of his father's shadow. Whereas Cody was so far after his dad wrestled that he, the shadow was gone. Yes. 
Yeah, no, definitely. And I mean, look what he's doing right now. Oh, I man. mean, it's he's doing great things right now. He is great matches. Uh, fifth match of the evening, Chris Jericho beat Perry Saturn via disqualification, eight this, minutes and 12 second match. This was a weird one because uh, I guess Perry Saturn had been uh, having some problems with the referee. Yeah. And the second that Jericho uh, turned Saturn over into the, into the lion tamer, the referee stopped the match. And so every place that I saw said disqualification. I was pretty sure that it was a uh, submission. But I went with the websites that I found to verify the information against. And they all said disqualification. So I went with disqualification. Yeah, it, it was a it weird was, match. It, it was a very weird match. Uh, sixth match of the evening was Juventud Guerrero and Psychosis beating WCW Cruiserweight Champion Billy Kidman and Rey Mysterio via pinfall uh, when Guerrero pinned Mysterio, and that was a seven minute and 36 second match. Guerrero. Juventud Guerrero. That's right. You yeah. had uh, Guerrero. I know. Uh, and then I'm you had Guerrero. It right now. <laughs> uh, seventh match of the seventh match of the evening. Conan beat WCW World Television Champion Scott He's Steiner. He's not a with, late night talk show host, dude. It's Conan. That's what I said. You Conan. Said, you said Conan. Did I say Conan? You said Conan. It's Conan. Conan. Uh, with Buff Bagwell in his corner via disqualification. That was a four minute and one second match. Um. Another weird match of the evening was Bam Bam Bigelow uh, drew uh, Wrath via no contest. Adam Bomb. Yeah. I was. I'm watching uh, WWF '93 right now. Okay. And uh, so, right in the middle of Adam Bomb's, uh, I guess you can say heel run. I guess. Uh huh. Um, I mean. He wasn't. It wasn't really much of a run for anything. He definitely had more success in WCW than he did in the WWF. Yeah. But um, I'll always remember a uh, quote from uh, Scott Keith, who wrestling writer, and he said in a review of Unforgiven 2001, he said, "If you had told me in 1995." That Crush and Adam Baum were going to team up against The Undertaker and Isaac Yankum to have the worst match of 2001, I would have said, well, duh. <laughs> uh, I do love the fact, though, by the way, getting back to No Mercy really quick, I do love the fact that uh, WWE when they showed a picture of uh, Cesaro missing his teeth, asking if they knew any good dentists or if Dr. Isaac Yankum was available. Yes. Uh, that, that was classic. And, and you got to give that, that kid who was sitting there on the camera side on Monday Night Raw holding the picture of the milk carton with Cesaro's missing front teeth. Uh, on it, that was that was pretty good too. So, uh, ninth match of the evening was Diamond Dallas Page uh, beating Brian Adams with Vincent in his corner via pinfall, eight minute and fifty eight second match. And then the match that started. Uh, you can't even say it started. The match that was the the what many people to this day consider uh, the nail in the coffin. Well, I I don't necessarily say it'll be the. It's not. It, it's the the first nail in the coffin. It was like yeah. it's like it's the glue that are holding the joists together for yeah. the coffin. It, it, it's um, it, it's it's responsible for the for the frame of the coffin being built now before we get into the results of this match we we do need to bring up one other thing that happened on this broadcast which was See now, hang on before we get into this would you say that this this nitro is more famous for the match or for the incident in what you're talking about what you're Me about to bring up Okay, me personally, I think it's more famous for the mankind incident I than it was so as well. Than it was the finger point of do the finger point of do. Finger poke. Um, finger poke. Sorry. Um, 
I, I forgot exactly where in the taping. I did not mark it down, but there it's is somewhere that, between the Bam Bam and Diamond Dallas Page area. Yes, near the and near so, the end of the show. You know, many of you listening know that during this time period, Raw was not live well, where Nitro every was. Other week. Every other week, exactly. They they would film, you know, two episodes uh, and, and tape delay one. And Eric Bischoff had gotten into the practice of giving away the results of the matches on Nitro for the Raw episodes that were taped. And so there's a point in this episode where Tony Schiavone goes, uh, fans, as Hollywood Hogan walks away, as you look at 40,000 plus on hand, if you even if you're even thinking about changing the channel to our competition, fans, do not. Because we understand that Mick Foley, who wrestled here one time as Cactus Jack, is going to win the wor- their world title. Ha! That's going to put some butts in the seats, hey? See, now, and- a lot of people think that that's kind of it. If you didn't watch this Nitro, you would think, because that's all Foley ever talked about, that's all they ever show. Yes. In the next segment, or a couple of segments after that, he completely is ignoring the match, and it's Shivani, and yes. is just, just, just cutting up Mick Foley. He is. And literally, by the time that was done... The Nielsen ratings for Nitro and and Raw had just switched. Um, basically, it said within minutes, as shown by Nielsen ratings, several hundred thousand viewers switched the channel from Nitro on TNT to Raw is War on the USA Network. After Mankind won the title, many of the fans then switched back to Nitro, which still had five minutes of airtime left. Showing that they the f- actually cared about what was on Nitro. Exactly. And that's where what they ended up doing with that last five minutes was the nail in the coffin. Because you basically took people who, you know, for me during that time period, and we've always said it, I was a WWF, WWE guy my entire life. Still am to the most part. You, on the other hand, we're we're always jumping back and forth I when was. we would talk about this and there were a lot of people who because of and let's be honest i mean this was the perfect storm i mean the stupid storyline which we forgot to even mention that by the way folks the the stupid stalker storyline that was oh, going goodness. on with with Miss Elizabeth and Goldberg and and you know i think that was another thing that when it finally came out everybody's like oh you know he's been arrested and they've taken him down to the precinct and then it came out that literally the precinct was right across the street from the football stadium yeah no you i know? think i think my favorite part of the entire goldberg getting arrested incident was him saying, I'm not capable of such a thing. I'm not a good guy. You know what I do. So to prove I'm innocent, I'm going to beat up a bunch of cops. You're going to have to take me down with all of your guns and all of your mace. I'm like, not going to let you arrest me. I mean, I'm, yeah, like that. I mean, granted, it fit into the whole 90s anti-hero. Oh, thing, yeah. No, no, totally. Know? It just, you know, but going back Austin and watching. Ne- Steve Austin never threatened to go down in a hail of gunfire. No, no, <laughs> no, no. He just, you know, made sure there were a couple well-placed shots here and there. But, uh, yeah, that was, that, you I mean, know, that's what my he, favorite thing. I'm a good guy. Now I'm going to fight some cops because I'm a role yeah. model for children. Oh, my God. That was that was just. But I think that was the thing. I mean, here it is. You it, it was the perfect storm. Stupid storyline with Goldberg, you know, Miss Elizabeth, you know, trying to keep him from getting his championship match. That card that we just went through, I mean, that was not a good card. Was it a for, bad card? What was that? Was it a bad card? It wasn't a bad card. But, you know, with everything that you had just watched on Nitro leading up to that segment, and then all of a sudden, they are telling you that there is going to be a title change on television, not a pay per view, but on television. And everybody switches over. Even people who weren't WWF fans at the time were still switched over. 
What was that? They were still Mick Foley fans. Well, exactly. They Mick knew Foley, Mick Foley. The King of the Ring made Mick Foley. Made, everyone knew who Mick Foley was. If you were a wrestling fan, or even not, you knew who yes. Mick Foley was because of the King of the Ring. Let no, me, definitely. Let me bring up one point. Okay. Is that WCW was already late to the party. Oh, that, yeah. That, the result of that match was broken on WWE.com the day it happened. Yeah. Um, I mean, WWE.com has a, has a history of doing that, of spoiling their own shows. Oh, yeah. And to drum up interest in people watching. Oh, Big Foley's oh. going to win the title? I got to see this. But once again, let's also preface 1999, the internet was not what the internet was today. True. So, I mean, unless you were glued to your computer and, and checking WWF.com at the time, you didn't know. And if you were watching Nitro, you know, the, the dirt sheets what weren't what the dirt sheets are today. Yep. Um, you know, a lot of these guys, you know, Dave Meltzer and even Wade Keller, I mean, they were putting out newsletters that you were having to get in the mail. Now you're getting everything emailed to you instantly. Oh, yeah. So these people who knew Mick Foley as Cactus Jack, all of a sudden here, you know, hey, he's going to win the title. They switched over and saw the kind of product that the WWF was having at the time, a, a fresher, you know, product, even though it wasn't live and just what they were doing storyline wise and everything. The match ends, you know, uh, Mrs. Foley's baby boy wins the title in a great moment. Uh, you know, in WWE history, one that I'll never forget. And then they switch back over to Nitro to, to see, see Kevin Nash and Hogan squaring off in what actually the crowd was way into. Because at the time you had, you know, the NWO Wolfpack, which were, you know, the good guys if you will. going up against, you know, NWO Hollywood. And it, it was it was gearing up to be, you know, that that match between, you know, original founders, good guy, bad guy. And then the finger poke. Happened. And then they completely screwed the pooch. They, they, to, they literally shit on the crowd. Yeah, it seemed that way. Like like it. And, and they were, oh, you ever hear a deja vu and all of that stuff? It was just, it was, it's not that the idea was a poor idea. It was poorly executed. Yes. And, and I really think that that, I, that idea on any other night yeah, would have Yeah, maybe worked. so. Maybe so. It, it literally was the it, it was that whole perfect storm scenario. Not a great card. Everybody switching over, seeing what happened in the WWF, coming back, and then seeing this happen. Yep. It was the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, and at this point, the WWF had already started to take over. They um, they were they, they but, were pretty much. I mean, the ratings were close. They but were, they but were, after but this night, they were not. WCW close again. never won another Monday nope. night ratings war again nope. and that was the end of the Monday Night Wars basically yeah and you know it, it really set up and it was a long painful slow death for WCW um, it was well it wasn't painful for WCW it was painful for the people that watched well exactly I watched I, mean, those, I was yeah, watching every step of you're, the way you're you're a diehard and pretty much will watch anything that that happens in a wrestling ring. Yeah, you're right. Um, you know, but I mean, you know, a lot of those guys had those massive guaranteed contracts. You know, they they were phoning it in. I mean, yeah, how how many of those guys had creative control over their characters at the time? Really I mean, not many. Well, it was Kevin Nash. Guy. Kevin Nash was heading up the booking committee at this point. Exactly, but I mean, he had control. Hall had control. No, Hogan had control. Oh, no, no, they didn't. Hogan was really the only one that had creative control. Nash was the head of the booking committee, so he had control. Hall was just drunk. Well, yeah, it's true. Um, it, it just... Everything that happened that night completely changed 
the face of wrestling as we know it. Yeah. I mean, Quite everything possibly. that everything that we are watching today is a result, as far as I'm concerned, of this one day. Because if this There's one definitely day... definitely an argument to be made for that. Yeah, because, I mean, if this one day did not happen and WCW was still in business, you know, Vince might not have might not be doing the things that he's doing now because there is no competition. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, Ring of Honor has a good product, but they're not big enough to go after the WWE. No. You know, T- TNA, Impact, GFW, Hokey Pokey, whatever the hell they call themselves next week. I mean, they've never been at that point where they were even considered. Their TNA has almost been like that annoying little Boston Terrier that's nipping at your ankle saying, hey, we're here, notice us, pay attention. And it's like, just get the hell away from me. The it, thing it, is, is that this night in the grand scheme of things changes nothing. Because at the end of the day, AOL Time Warner still happens. And Jamie Kellner still cancels WCW programming. They were still one of the highest rated shows on TNT. That's true. And they got canceled. So this one night changes nothing. The the linchpin that for for the WCW demise was always will always be the AOL Time Warner merger. That doesn't yes. happen. WCW still exists. It, well, I don't know if we could say that because when we look at what was going on storyline wise, a lot of guys were starting to leave again. I mean, look at we got the radicals because of the way right. WCW but that, stuff, that stuff happens in in shifts because there were still guys from WWF going to WCW. Dustin Runnels and a few yeah. others were still showing up in WCW as well. So those things happen. There's guys going from WWF to TNA, GFW, whatever, uh, right now. And guys going from WWE to Ring of Honor and from Ring of Honor to WWE, it, it happens all over the place. So yeah. the uh, if the AOL Time Warner merger doesn't happen, then WCW gets bought by Eric Bischoff, is still on Turner Broadcasting, and still has a place. And then when he if he if if he manages to repair the brand, then he can shop around for other networks once once TNT and TBS inevitably kick them off. Yeah. But here's the problem. It, it, I don't know if they would have been able to because no wrestling promotion other than the WWE has really been able to land a successful television contract. Yeah, but WCW was on par with WWE at the time. Yeah. So I, I can see where so you're going. Not, I just, they're not I just TNA that's starting from the ground up. No, 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 no. I know that. But I'm just trying to figure out where would they have gone. I mean, that that's my thing. At well, that time and place, I where... I, I, I think that's a completely, uh, you know, at, at that different point in time. Topic. Look, yeah, because, I mean, you, you had FX that was an up-and-coming network. They could have gone there. Um, you, you've had you had uh, a couple. Well, you others, had Spike, probably. which w, WWF ended up going to Spike for a in short that period, period of time, time from 2000 to 2005. So they could yeah. have gone to USA. Yeah, or they could have even gone as crazy as it sounds. Even though they were a Southern-based promotion, one of the biggest networks out there, uh, you know, WGN. Yeah. You know, they could have well, they, they could have even see, gone there. They were a Chicago network at that point in time. They weren't even national. Now you got WG in America. Like yeah. you're 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 talking about it from, from now. Today's standard. You're right. Yeah. I wasn't thinking about that. Sinclair, Ring of Honor is gonna wind up being on WGN. Yeah. I, at least I that's what I would do. I, I so, hope so. Yeah. I mean, with that kind of exposure, uh, that would be good for them. So, I mean, it's just – it's one of those where, you know, I, I just – a lot of people go back to this date and just say, you know, this was the day where 
you know, Vince Vince basically won. Um, that I will give you because yeah. because I don't I it's it's almost impossible to see a scenario in which WCW manages to strike gold again. Yeah. And I think just so many people got tired of being burned with finishes and some of the storylines that were going on that literally the the finger poke of doom was the straw that broke the camel's back with a lot of WCW fans. I 100% agree with you on that. They, They just were tired of being crapped on. They were tired of, you know, basically being treated like idiots. Yeah. Uh, and and at, a, at a certain point, WCW, you know, and we won't kind of get into what's going on outside of wrestling right now. But, you know, WCW is suffering from the mentality that a lot of things like the NFL right now uh, are dealing with where they almost feel like they're bigger than everything else. Right. And that you love us so much. You can't live without us that we're just going to crap on you and you're going to take it yep. no matter what we do because we're so important. Yep. You can't live without us. So if you had to rate this show as a whole, what would you give it? Uh, we giving it a one through a 10 or no, an A? I'd, I'd say an A through an A, a letter grade. Uh, I literally would give this show a D minus. I'd give it a C minus. Um, some of the stuff that went on in the show wasn't terrible. The the main angles of the show were god awful, but it had decent matches. It was not. It wasn't a bad show. It had elements of the show that were so bad that it dragged the rest of the show down with it. But if you can, well, if see, you can look at the for- the rest of the show as as independent, it it definitely can stand on its own. You see, for me, the reason why I gave it such a low grade is unlike other, you know, Nitros, that show started off so slow. There just wasn't anything. And I mean, yeah, it was great to see Flair back and, you know, the whole storyline where where him and David were going right. to team up together. Yep. You know, that was great and all. But what it took to get to there. Kind of like us getting through this segment. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, it just, you know, there was... We're letting, we're letting that, everybody feel what we had to go through <laughs> watching this episode of Nitro. I, I, I think, yeah, we're, we're, we're uh, projecting our, uh, our disappointment with this episode. Apparently. Uh, but yeah, there was no pop to start off that, that show. Yes. There was no, you know, nothing to put asses in the seat and keep them there. I mean, there were points where I was watching this and I was going, when are we finally going to get to something? No, I mean, so basically it was a, it was a firework with a it was a firecracker with a three foot long wick that we lit it it took 20 minutes for it to light and then when it finally went off it shot straight into the barn and set it on fire (laughs) you know what that is probably the best analogy that i i can think of so you know what we're just going to end it on that and then next week it's your turn to choose for the ghost of wrestling pass so tell us what you picked well um, I, I've been long opposed to doing the first this and the first that because I feel like everyone does that. But I'm going against my own rules, and next for next week we are going to watch and review ECW Barely Legal 97, the first ever ECW pay-per-view. Nice. Yes. So that Good should choice. be a fun one. Uh, there yep, is a collection for it on w- the WWE Network. So if you want to watch some of the build up to it, you can do that as well. Okay. I plan to, so we can talk about it in more detail because I didn't really get into ECW until probably like 1999. About the same for me. I mean, mine was more around like 2000. And then definitely got into it more when you and I started hanging out. Yeah. Um, it definitely before, you know, they were sold to Vince. But, you know, that that was for me. It, it For me, it was more right around the tail end yeah, me too. of their their run before Vince picked them up. And then they brought in the whole invasion angle. So. Right. So we're going to do that next week. But right now we're going to go to the uh, we're going to. 
I don't know when I was going to re- reintroduce the last segment. Right now, we're going to go into the indie spotlight. Indie, indie wrestling. wrestling. Indie, indie wrestling. wrestling. Indie 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 wrestling. Okay, let's jump right in with the indie results from last week. First, Lucha Libre and Laughs crowned their first women's champion at Smash the Glass Ceiling on September 22nd. In the semifinals of the women's championship tournament, Lainey Luck beat Rochelle Riveter, Ali Gato beat Solo Darling, and Leva Bates beat Sage Sin. In a non-tournament match, Lucha Libre and Laughs champion Lonnie Valdez beat Len Parker. Then, in the tournament final, Ali Gato beat Lainey Luck and Leva Bates in a triple threat match to become the first Lucha Libre and Laughs Women's Champion. Also, on September 22nd, Rocky Mountain Pro held an event at the Rackhouse Pub. On September 23rd, Rocky Mountain Pro held an event at the Quarry on the Jefferson County Fairgrounds. If anyone attended either of these events and would like to provide us with the results so we can add those to our database, please email us at prowrestlingalmanac at gmail.com. Finally, Primo's Professional Wrestling celebrated their 10th anniversary on Sunday, September 24th at the 8th Annual Slave to the Death Match. J.D. Horror, who has competed in several of these tournaments, outlasted previous tournament champions I Am The Provider, Mosh Pit Mike, and Chewy Martinez, along with other performers such as XPW alumni Homeless Jimmy, Luchador Bestia666, and the only female in the tournament, Sage Sin, and became the Slave to the Death Match champion. Following his victory, J.D. Horror announced his retirement from professional wrestling. Also on the show, hardcore wrestling legend New Jack took on Primo's 303 champion Eric Angel in a non-title match. New Jack battered and bloodied Angel before finishing him off with a balcony dive. For our indie spotlight this week, I'd like to talk about Rise Wrestling out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They're a young promotion founded in December 2016, and they run monthly shows at the Stronghold Arena in Lamont Furnace, Texas. Their next show takes place on October 28th and will be the start of a tournament to crown the first ever Rise Wrestling Champion. The tournament will conclude in December at Rise's first anniversary show. You can find more information about Rise Wrestling on Facebook at Rise Wrestling, that's R-Y-S-E Wrestling, and on Twitter at Rise underscore Wrestle. To get your indie fix this week, you can catch New Era Wrestling on Saturday at September 30th at Mile High Comics for the Mile High Metal Show. Mile High Comics is located at 4600 Jason Street in Denver, Colorado. Doors open at 5.30 p.m. with a 6 p.m. showtime, and tickets are only $8 with proceeds to benefit the Chelsea Hutchinson Foundation. Also on Saturday, September 30th, you can catch Rocky Mountain Pro at Old Town Throwdown in Lafayette, Colorado. Catch RMP champion Mario Van Jour, Lockheads champion Alligato, and Medi Moore at Romero's K9 Club and Tap House. If you pre-order tickets at therockymountainpro.com, you can get them for only $10, but they will cost more at the door. The address for the show is 985 South Public Road in Lafayette, Colorado, and the showtime is at 9 p.m. And as always, if you attend any wrestling show, we would love to get the results, and you can send those to prowrestlingalmanac at gmail.com. And that's it, folks. Uh, Remember, please check out our website, prowrestlingalmanac.com, Facebook, and follow us on Twitter and Instagram, at PW Almanac. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and on iTunes. Once again, we can be heard now on TuneIn Radio as well as Google Play. Well, that's it, folks. The ref has given us the 10 count, which means we're done for tonight. So until next week, I'm Mike. And for Chad and Tristan, thanks for listening. Or just Tristan because Chad's sick. That's right. Chad's sick. Uh, So thanks for listening. And we'll see you again when the bell rings.